Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us Amanda Russell, who is an international marketing strategist, speaker, educator, and entrepreneur. Amanda, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Hey, so I'm sure that all of that has quite the long background and speaker and educator and entrepreneur and strategist and, wow, when do you sleep and, and uh, how do you fit things into your day? So catch us up to what your background is that led you into this field of focus with influencer marketing. Yeah, so it's been a very unconventional path. And to give you sort of the, the bird's eye view, I actually never started out to be um, an entrepreneur ever. That would have been the furthest thing on my radar. Um, I actually grew up as a competitive runner in a small town in northern Canada, and my um, I was always very, very, um, what's the word for that? Structured. Would be structured and focused yeah. and running and times and everything was very, was very much fits that mold. And uh, the thing about running is that it's a very um, objective sport, meaning that there's no subjectivity in it, whether you're successful or you're not in terms of competitive running. A time on a track is a time on a track anywhere in the world. And so coming from a small town, knowing that that sport, I could do that, I didn't need resources, that it literally became my ticket out. Uh, I learned about something called a scholarship in the United States. And that if I could run certain times, that I could write my ticket to a full scholarship in the U.S. And so running quickly became my identity and my career. And it wasn't until I had a career-ending injury uh, before the 2008 Olympics that basically stopped my career in its track. And I went through sort of, not sort of, I would say a full-on identity crisis uh, where all, you know, you are so confident in what you're doing and you, you know where you're going and you've got all of this support and all of these people around you and then within like a day, it's just gone. And that struggle was, you know, I would say that I mean, people use all the time that running is an analogy for life. And it's funny because running, which literally was my life, metaphorically became kind of the theme for my life. And yeah. it gave way to this failure on this level that I had never experienced before. And, and I remember thinking, oh my God, I've come this far, I've worked this hard to go home to my small town and live with my parents. Sounds absolutely like the worst, the, the worst thing in the world. Not because my parents aren't great people and I have a great family, but I felt like I had worked so hard to get to, 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 to achieve a certain level to go back that way. And that's when I decided, okay, well, if I, I want to do something that I care as much about. And how do I apply? And I think that's where a lot of us get confused to it. How do I apply what I have done into something else and into business? And I remember thinking, if I can't go to the pinnacle of the, the, the athletic world, which I thought was the Olympics for running, then I would like to go to the pinnacle of the corporate world, which in my head, in my dream, was New York City. And so the long story short of it is that I used my running experience to get sponsored by a big consulting firm in New York City. And that's when I really learned the power of influence, because getting a job in New York with no work experience is hard enough. But doing it to have to get a visa, a visa sponsored uh, by a big company is really was really really presenting a challenge. Sure. Uh, and so, yeah. So I used I, I I used what I had. I'm like, well, they don't know me, but they know Nike, which was my sponsor, and they know the Olympics, and they could probably imagine what it might take to be a competitive runner. So I'm not going to compete on experience. I'm going to use that. And those were my very first influencers, Nike, the Olympics. They're not always humans. And I sent a pair of shoes in a box to the three big, big 
firms that I wanted to work for. And I, that, though, that, that box of shoes and a personal note with all of the work ethic and dedication that I had that I could now give solely to their firm got me the interview and eventually got me the job. And that became the beginning of my career that set the stage for my ability to sort of start my own company, to go back to business school, to experiment with different things. And, I, and that experience was the start of me being obsessed with this use. I didn't use the term influencer. I used the term force. So what are the forces that affect people's decision-making, your audience's decision-making in the action you want them to happen? So, you know, whether it was a gatekeeper at these firms and using Nike in the Olympics. And then again, when it was my pitching to Trium Entertainment in Los Angeles to be business partners, what, what were the things that mattered to them and how could I leverage what I had? And so that's sort of the, the, the beginnings of the story of how I started my career and pivoted into, into marketing. Yeah, well, I love that because it's like a lot of people who are in the military, they come out and they go, wow, um, I learned so much and structure and organization and confidence and all these things. And yeah. those same principles apply in business. Well, same with athleticism, diligence and discipline and all of these things, you know, um, positive thinking and, and all of the, the um, ways you succeed in, in sports definitely translate over. So I love that, that um, juxtaposition. And I want to uh, point out something that you said um, about, you know, yeah, yeah, we didn't know really that we didn't call it influence marketing. And, and I was it reminded me, I was listening to a um, interview with um, Joe Polish on I love marketing podcast and recently, and, and um, he was saying that, you know, he just doesn't call it influencer marketing. And it's you know, like, you know, ugh, because you don't know what you're influencing. You don't know how many people and who they're talking. So in reality, it should be results, you know, driven. It should be results um, uh, of, of the influence. So talk a little about, about your approach to influencer marketing, because I know you have a, a different spin on things. Yeah, I think everybody's got a different um, different outlook. But at the end of the day, I think in order to understand influencer marketing, we must first understand influence because influence is an outcome, not necessarily a job description or a, a job title. And so that's why it's so cringeworthy when someone says, I'm an influencer, because yeah. how do you know you're an influencer? How do you, and what are you influencing? And everybody, at the end of the day, and I was on another podcast and, you know, the host asked me a question, and I guess he came from a PR background, and he said, well, the way that you're defining it, it that means that anybody could be an influencer. And I said, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Because everybody in their own, who is your, it depends on the audience, and it depends on what you want to happen. So everybody is an influencer. If you are a son, a daughter, a mother, a father, a coach, a teacher, uh, you know, a colleague, you have influenced somebody's decision in some way. So Social media is getting confused as influencer marketing and size of one's audience is getting confused as influencer and all of these things. And that was one of the things that I got so passionate about wanting to write this book. And it's, it's interesting because as soon as people initially hear influencer marketing and then I create, I teach courses on influencer marketing at university, they go, Oh, like the eye roll, the cringe, the, um, the, the joke, the kind of jokes, snickers about like are you going to teach me how to build my instagram selfie following yep. um yeah. and that's really not what this is at all well i think it's interesting that you you talk about um you know the way that you approach influencer marketing um because it, it really is something that has a lot of misperceptions you you see the people on whatever social media platform standing in front of the ferrari standing in front of their mansion and you're going is that really yours because it could just be posing in front of it and then really what's the substance of what they're influencing and to your point you you can have you can be influential over a small group of people and in many cases that might be the more powerful influencer for your product service rather than some mega star whoever that might be that you agree to pay a bunch of money to be seen it holding your handbag or whatever that it is because you get some of these mom bloggers or whatever in the smaller realm that go well they're engaged whereas the big influencer they're like oh we got this pop of whatever, but then it doesn't sustain. 
Exactly. And, and even using the term influencer for somebody that's posing a picture in front of a, you know, their sports car or whatever, there's a really, I think we're confusing influencer with social media or content creator because uh, getting attention and getting engagement is not the same as, as having influence. So yeah. you can you can be a celebrity all day long. You can you can have a million followers. You can get a ton of buzz and attention, popularity, but it doesn't equate to influence. Uh, a great example of this is a client that I had a while back, who was one on one of the housewives shows, and she uh, portrayed a lifestyle that was very uh, you know very glamorous and very bling bling, and she used to get all kinds of inquiries from like designer handbag brands and designer clothing brands to endorse their product. And when she would pose with, you know, a new handbag and a new outfit, she would get not only all of the, you know, popular, all the attention, all of these, all of these like vanity metrics that a lot of companies and agencies are looking for, which is likes and comments and shares, you know, now they've graduated to, oh, it's not just about followers, but it's about the engagement, this vague term, and then she would get she, she would get that by any metric of engagement in terms of conversations. Her followers would have conversations amongst themselves about her her outfit. But at the end of the day, she couldn't convert one sale. Why? Because her audience was not other women that were spending, you know, a thousand dollars plus on a handbag. Yes. That just wasn't her audience. It was middle to lower income, um, middle America housewives that only could aspire to that lifestyle. So they would love it and engage with it all day long, but you couldn't sell one bag. Well, you know, it's kind of so like, um, reminds me when you, when you think about, you know, hey, um, do this uh, a pre-campaign testing, do a quick survey to your audience, and hey, here's my new widget. Would you guys buy it? They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you launch it and nothing. Well, why is that? Because it's easy to go yes, 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 but it's harder to pull out your credit card and pay for it. Exactly. Yes. And, and, and just that notion that popularity and attention in celebrity is different than influence, I think is a really big deal. And it's something that brands and people have to think about because what happens in, mar- in a lot of marketing and, and in PR and advertising, all of these disciplines that, that uh, put your product to try to garner awareness and buzz, everybody thinks about buzz. They don't think about what is the behavior we want to achieve? What is the, and is it on brand for us? I call it the three B's framework, which I learned from um, the very first mentor professor of mine who used the three B's framework to, to, um, to analyze and to evaluate any brand strategy, marketing strategy, ad campaign before either implementing one and or to look at others. And that is, Yes, we can look at buzz, but how does that tie back to the brand and what is the behavior we're trying to achieve? And that would solve so that would that would solve so many campaigns that fall flat or why a marketing campaign gets a bad bad rap or what you know, all of the all of the flaws could be overlooked if we really looked at it holistically. I agree 100%. You need to begin with the end in mind, like we learned from Stephen Covey years ago. And I really resonated with uh, your mention of vanity metrics. So let's dive a little bit deeper into vanity metrics, because that has application in anything. Hey, I made a million dollars last year in my business. Yahoo! But we spent a million too in expenses, so whatever. Hey, we had this many hits on our website. Yay! So what? Did you sell anything? So what is how does vanity metrics uh, integrate in with what you teach your clients in about influencer marketing? Yeah, and I like that you, you quoted this, start with the end of mind, and that's actually step one in my, in my book, in, in, the code, in the code, is is the goal. And the goal is very different than objective. And the goal is the end result. If you're a for-profit business, your goal is to make money and or to increase market share, to increase your bottom line. And we get confused with objectives, which are things like, you know, raise awareness, click, uh, let's, let, let's, let's get a, you know, X number of sales. So as you said, sales don't matter if you're overspending that amount. Um, yeah. So you have to start with the, 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 the actual goal, which is the, the bottom line, which then dictates your objectives. And some of those objectives then fall into these vanity metrics, right? So they can help. They're like, they're like mile markers. 
um, they can help the story, but they are not the story. By trying to force those metrics as a result, I think tells the wrong story and the wrong campaign because, you know, one, one great example that I love is, you know, some of the biggest brands on the planet. Look at PepsiCo. In 2010, we'll go back to 2010 because it was such a, a big one. They did something that was that had never been done before, and they pulled their whole Super Bowl ad campaign uh, in favor of this social media campaign. And for its time, it was so advanced, and it did so well on 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 every on every vanity metric level you can imagine. So like. They had people interacting. The, the idea was for people to vote for their favorite charities to get money, to give money. And so I think at one point, one in every three Americans was, was said to be known, to have known about the campaign. So on, on paper, the ad agency might have won and won all the awards. The marketing department's fired. Why? Because Pepsi actually, for the first time in history, lost market share and became number three behind Diet Coke. Why? Because the campaign was all about getting these vanity metrics that actually had nothing to do with, act, with, with tying back to buying Pepsi. It had mostly to do with just this buzz and engagement and awareness, yep. but they didn't think about the brand and the behavior. Well, and then you, you, that makes me think of this, which is so um, uh, prevalent. You know, hey, look at that wonderful commercial, that Super Bowl commercial, that, oh, that's funny, ha, ha, ha. And you ask the person, oh, what was it, the, the brand? What were they advertising? <laughs> I don't know. You know, Puppy Monkey. Right? I, I think that was Mountain Dew, Dorit. I don't know. You know, so it's like, what's the point? You need a clear brand message that maybe is, is deepened by something fun and exciting. But what is the point if, you know, the bottom line, nobody cares until sales are made. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why I think, you know, we have, we can't have marketing or advertising or PR, you know, exist in a silo. It has to be, it has to be a fundamental business strategy with the bottom line in mind. Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, listen, I, I just love, I could just tell that this book is chock full of deep thoughts and strategy. So what's the best way people can reach out, connect with you and learn more about picking up a copy of your book? Thank you. Uh, so you can get that on my website, which you can get there two ways, just amandarussell.co. And that's just my name with two S's and two L's and russell.co uh, or the influencer code, which is the name of the book.com. Um, and of course, like everything else is sold on Amazon, uh, on Amazon, but I'm on all the major social and I love this stuff. So questions, examples, or I love when people present other, you know, cases and examples. I do make case studies for a living. So, uh, absolutely love, um, new, new, interesting stories. So please get in touch. Um, if you have Excellent. some really cool, your own, your own business, uh, case studies. Perfect. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for coming on today. It was really great talking with you. Yeah, you as well. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.